Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to be clung to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Today is Worldwide Communion Sunday. It is the day in which people from all over this world come together and celebrate of all kinds of denominations, of all kinds of cultures and uh, different backgrounds and different languages and different places all over this world coming together to celebrate in unity the one thing that they all have in common. And that thing is to recognize that they were sinners who could not save themselves apart from the grace of Jesus Christ. And so they could gather, celebrate around the world, partaking in communion to remember that thing that Christ did that we could not do for ourselves. In our passage today, Paul is talking to the church of Philippi. And in chapter 2, he is addressing the unity that is necessary for the church to function adequately. He says so in verse 2, working together with one heart and purpose. You see, when it, it is when we follow the instructions that Paul lays out for us that we can function as we need to function in unity and in purpose. See, the purpose that God has given to us of the church, universal, made up of all believers, is to want to worship God, to give Him the praise that is due Him, to make disciples of those who have known Him, that they grow deeper in their understanding and faithfulness to Him, and thirdly, to evangelize and to reach those who have not accepted Christ as their Savior and Lord. And those three bring us together to a sense of unity that Paul is saying here in chapter 2. This is not just a desirable trait, but it is essential to do the work that he is asking us to carry out. Jesus himself in John, the 13th chapter, says, Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. It is the evidence that the world may see. And so, Paul is using this as an example of our unity together. And in verse 3, he starts out with the attributes that are needed for that to take place. He talks about, in verse 3, not to be selfish. We live in a society that is, it's easy to be selfish in our society. It's easy to want to do what we want to do. It's easy to ask ourselves the question, what's in it for me? Why should I do that? But for the Christian, the question should not be, what's in it for me, but what's in it for Jesus? What can I do to promote Jesus? What can I do to live in Christ's love and to demonstrate that to the world that is around us? What is it that I can do to promote and spread the kingdom of God? To think less about my individual concerns and think more about what is beneficial to his kingdom. Verse 5 points out to us that it says, He did not demand and cling to his rights as God. Though he could have. 
He had every right to demand these things. He was God. And yet, coming here, he did not cling to the things that were due him in terms of his honor and glory, but instead laid them aside. Jesus, as he hung on the cross in Matthew 26, said, Don't you realize that I could have asked my Father for a thousand angels to protect us, and he would have sent them instantly? See, Jesus was not a victim. He chose to do the things that he wanted to do, to achieve the things he wanted to do. And sometimes, from our perspective, that didn't seem like it was the thing that would benefit him, to die on a cross. But he didn't do it to benefit him. He did it to benefit us. In his love, and his grace, and his compassion, to die for us, he voluntarily gave up his right. And so he calls and asks that we would do so as well. Now, some people get confused here in what they think that means of giving up his rights. If we look at Jesus, he did what God had asked him to do. He was never persuaded by what human opinion was or what they had instructed him to do. Instead, he simply sought his Father's will. And so that is what we need to do. Seek and to do what God has asked us to do individually and collectively turning over our own preferences over to Him, seeking not the expectation of human beings, which will always change, but the expectations of God, which will never change. He continues in verse 3 when he says, don't try to impress others. It's kind of a base instinct within us to want to impress people. At least a little bit. We don't want them to think we're, we're too stupid or too ugly or incompetent. You know, we want them to at least be impressed to some degree. And yet, Jesus could lay that aside. He didn't have any concerns about the impressions of people who were around him as long as he was doing what God wanted. Because when we do what God wants, the side effect is that the truth is said and that the truth is drawing to those who have a heart who's sensitive to it. And that's what he's calling us to. Not to try to make ourselves better. Not to try to talk about the things that we've done or accomplished or where we came from or who our parents were or our education or our salaries or anything. It won't amount to much to God. What he cares about is the things that we do to promote and carry forth his will and his kingdom. He wants us, as he says in verse 7, to make ourselves nothing. That seems so counterintuitive to us. We think, how can that be right? I, I don't want to feel like nothing. What he's saying is that I have taken away, I've stripped away everything that is pulling me away from God so that wholeheartedly and fully and deeply I can pursue him that I don't have to concern myself with what human beings are saying if it contradicts God. I only need to fulfill the things that God is asking. You see, Jesus created the world. He came into this world. He emptied himself and came here. And yet this world did not recognize him. It didn't praise him or uplift him. To many, Jesus was not impressive. But he didn't seek to impress. He sought to say what was true, what was right, to point out man's sin and the means to find salvation. Yet he dealt with this sense of pride that is indwelling in most of us. In Matthew 6, one case when he's talking with the Pharisees, those of religious reputation, when he said, take care. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired because you will lose your reward from your Father in heaven. When you give a gift to someone in need, don't shout about it as hypocrites do to call attention to their acts of charity. I assure you, they have received their reward, all they will ever get. But when you give to someone, don't tell what your left hand, what your right hand is doing. Give your gift in secret and your Father who knows all secrets will reward you. Do what is right in dependence of the praise or the lack of praise of human beings. 
And Jesus wasn't just talking about money because in the very next verses, he's talking about prayer. To give to God the things that are due God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, in fact, some parts that are weakest and least important are the most necessary. See, we are all part of the body of Christ if we have accepted Him. Christ is the head and we are all parts of His body. And just as the body has different functions, my finger doesn't do the same thing as my pancreas, right? At least BJ smiled. I saw that. Good, thanks. Um, but as we're doing those things and we realize that we see these external things, we see our skin, we see our hands, we see our legs, those things are visible, easy to see. What our liver's doing, what our kidney's doing, and whether they're functioning healthy or not, sometimes those things are harder to see. And yet, we know that if those things that are unseen are not functioning right, ooh, they probably affect our health more than our hand. If our liver isn't functioning right, even though it is unseen, for a while we can appear healthy, but really, we are not healthy. And so... God's metaphor is the things that are unseen in our function, the things that we do that other people cannot see, our prayer lives, our devotion to Him, our thoughts, our attitudes. Those things produce just as much health, if not more so than the things that are unseen. As Jesus said to one of the churches in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, I know all things you do, that you have a reputation for being alive, but are dead. See, Jesus isn't concerned about our reputation of what people think. He cares about what actually is. What's going on inside. You see, it's so much better to spend our time in prayer and reading and the things that help our internal sides motivate and to know Him and to recognize Him. In verse 3, then he moves on and talks about being humble, thinking of others is better than yourselves, which kind of goes with the last point, though the verbs there were usually indicating um, a sense of doing something. Here he's more talking about an attitude that we reflect in our understanding of who we are and where we stand in the world. It's maybe highlighted again in another passage in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 18 when Jesus tells this story. Two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer, I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers, and I'm not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed and instead beat upon his chest and in sorrow said, O oh God, be merciful to me for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, return home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. God asks that we seek him in humility. And all we need to do to be humbled is to think, of some of the worst things that we've ever done. Sometimes it's easy, we point fingers, but if you've ever noticed when we point fingers, we've, we've always got three pointing back at us. Someone told me that if you're ever going to accuse or point at someone, try to think of three things that you've done that you need to apologize about or work on or ask God to forgive you about. It's probably a, a fairly good practice to think about those things in our own lives that each one of us needs to look at our attitudes and what they've been. It's so easy to puff ourselves up at times, but in fact, it is the thing that brings disunity into God's church. He's talking about relationship here. He's talking about uh, being humble as a person and to demonstrate that. Jesus lived it. He got down on his knees and he did the positions of the, the lowest, washing people's feet. Ultimately, of course, he died on the cross, which is probably the most humbling thing that has ever happened to a person. Although he could have stopped it at any moment, he never did. Not because he probably wasn't in excruciating pain, but because he loved you and me. And despite the sin that I've done and you've done, he said, I love you enough to endure this because I want you to know my Father. I will humble myself 
even unto death on a cross. Because that is my message to you. And all he asks in return is to reflect, as Paul said, the same attitude is Christ Jesus. That if we say we are Christians, the ones who follow Jesus, to reflect his attitude. And it is in that humility that we will find him. In the Roman world, humility was one of the worst things a person could be. It was considered one of the greatest vices you could have. But Jesus took the expectations of the world and he flipped it on its ear and said, it was in the humility that you most often find God. In verse 4, he talks about being interested in others. You see, we all have our own function. We all have our own gifts and talents. God has equipped and made each one of you so different, so unique. And that he has given you those gifts to benefit his body. Isn't that wonderful? That Michelle is different than Bonnie, who's different than Robin, who's different than Jamie, who's different than Lyle. Because God has created you all different, to function differently within his body. And yet, even though we have distinct functions, he says that we must be interested in each other. So that each part of the body is not independent of each other. It's all working one system. If my pancreas isn't working good, my kidneys can't say, ah, I'll take up the slack, it's fine, I'll do that job. It can't really function that way. Every part needs to function in the way. And so we love and we encourage each other to function as God created each person to be. Because the kingdom of God is made up of people. That's who's in it. Everything else, all the stuff, buildings and cars, houses, all the things that we're probably stressed and worried about will one day pass away, except for the people who are sitting around you, the people outside of these walls, the people that work with you, your neighbor that bothers you. Like all these people, they have eternal souls. And they have a destiny of those souls. And God desires that they come into his kingdom and that his church work to actively do those things. Verse 8 says that in human form, he humbled himself by dying that criminal's death on the cross. He did so not for himself, but he saw what would happen as the result of his greater plan. And that's the point of humbling ourselves. To humble ourselves, not to just be the most humble, not to appease and do what other people want, not to, uh, yeah, whatever, get the pat on the back from God, but that in humbling ourselves, we open ourselves up to receive what God is asking for us to do. And in that humility, God guides us to His greater good, the things that sometimes we can see right in front of us and sometimes we don't for five, ten years down the road. But God does. And He is good. And so He asks us in His goodness to trust Him. Just think, what hasn't God gotten you through? As Dave Ernie would probably tell you. Nothing. Or you wouldn't be here. God continues to guide us. Today, we talked about that as Worldwide Communion Sunday. And so, in doing so, God calls us together in unity. And in that unity, He calls us together in humility to reflect the attitude of Jesus Christ and so the parts of ourselves which we all have that are in rebellion against God he says give them to me stop seeking our senses of pride and accomplishment stop looking for pats on the back and look for the only pat from God that matters that when we enter into heaven that God says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That you have done the things that I've asked you to do, that you work together to achieve the things that I've asked you to do. Let us pray. Father God, in just a moment we are going to celebrate an act of the Lord's Supper. The fact that we are sinners saved only by the grace of Jesus Christ. That as we eat of the bread and the cup, we know that we will humble ourselves. And in confession, to know that we have fallen short of your standard of perfection.
But somehow, and for some reason, in your mercy and grace, we rejoice that we find ourselves in your warm and loving embrace, remembering what you did for us, that in remembering, may we be motivated to share that with a world that desperately needs it, because God, you are so good. And I ask that it would be the deepest desire of each one of our hearts that you would speak your truth into our lives, that our lives would, as our scripture said, had the same attitude that you had. That Jesus Christ, though he were God, did not consider equality with God something to be clung to, but instead gave up his divine privileges, taking the humble position of a slave, being born as a human being, appearing in human form, humbling himself in obedience to God and dying a criminal's death on the cross. And then that God, you had voted him to the highest honor, that you have given him the name that is above all names, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, that every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen.